quorum. Well, oh, there's E and uh, folks, Sean and everybody uh, at home on on Zoom. And so we're just going to go ahead. We are we are back from exec session. We're going to go ahead and get started. And we do, I believe, have modifications to the agenda. And we would just like to uh, note those, and we'll do a quick vote on those modifications. Um, okay, I'll move the uh, modification to the agenda um, as item number 6.1 under the consent agenda, consideration of accounts, the Enfield Geothermal well, uh, well quote. Exactly, right. And we going to modify as well. Oh, okay. So I would do both of them. Yeah. Do both of them at the same time. And yeah, then sure. uh, modifying the agenda to um, add board responses. So uh, item 4.2 will be board responses to public comment. And then the student reps become item 4.3. And then the Board response following student reps would be 4.4. Exactly. Thanks. Second Sarah. both motions. Second by Sean and um, Tricia, go ahead and we'll call the roll. Bob Ainsley. Yes. Erin Croyle. Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Yes. Eldred Harris. Nicola Fave. Yes. Moira Lang. Yes. Chris Malcolm. Yes. Ann Reichlin. Pat Wazley. Yes. Very good. Thanks, everyone. And so we'll, we'll continue to move on and uh, we'll go right to public comment, receiving um, comments from the folks that uh, signed up. Uh, there's two in the room, um, and I think we have some folks. Uh, at home. And so Moira, please go ahead. Yes. So uh, we're going to hear the, the folks who are present. Uh, so the first is Rabbi Safman. And I guess it's the microphone over. The, oh, right there. Right. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you don't mind, I'll lower it a bit. I'm not quite as uh, tall as your ambitious uh, technician. <laughs> that um, firstly, I'd like to thank the board. I'd like to uh, thank the people who uh, were instrumental in pulling together uh, the draft versions of the academic year calendar for the 2021-2022 academic year. Um, I run a much smaller and much less complex institution in its calendar, and I have a deep appreciation for just how complicated the task of putting together an academic year calendar must be for a district as broad and diverse as this. Uh, so I thank you for creating the calendar, and I thank you for opening it to public review before adopting it. Um, as I made clear in my written statements, which uh, I submitted to the board, the original draft of the calendar that positioned the opening day of the coming academic year, uh, as far as staff was concerned, on the first day of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and for elementary students and those entering newly the middle and high school on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, was something that was really not only problematic, but at some deep level injurious uh, to members of my community of Jewish community, uh, in part because of just pragmatically the decisions that it was forcing upon our families, those who are staff, as well as those who are students, uh, to make this trade-off between full participation in their academic program for this, in the case of staff, uh, especially those who are hourly staff, between putting food on the table for their family uh, and observing their religious obligations as they see it. I was so pleased to receive today uh, a version, a second version of the calendar that addressed the concerns that I raised. And without understanding quite what the status of the two drafts is, I just want to reiterate to you uh, how meaningful it is to my community and I think to, to the vast majority of the, the minority communities here in the Ithaca area, that the school district is so mindful of our presence and of the unique cultural uh, and other needs 
uh, that our distinctive religious and cultural traditions introduce in terms of our participation in society as large. Uh, I just got off the phone a half an hour ago with Mahmoud Burton, who is the head of the local Muslim community. Uh, and we were commiserating with one another. It's a common feature of life for religious minorities in the United States, in any country in which they are a minority community, to constantly be in a process of, of negotiating their community's needs, their religious demands, with the expectations of the larger society that doesn't share those needs uh, in the same way. And that negotiation is, is something that we're accustomed to, much as I would assume that members of the African American, Latinx, and Asian American communities are kind of historically accustomed to the idea that when they send their kid into a public school classroom or into other public spaces, that the curriculum and that other aspects of the culture and the, the rhetoric presented there is not gonna reflect their distinctive experiences. And to a certain extent, that's a negotiation that you just habituate yourself to and accept as, as part of maintaining your distinctive identity. But in the same way that the Ithaca schools have shown a real sensitivity over the years to making adjustments in issues of curriculum to reflect the distinct sensibilities and needs and the more complete truth represented by being sensitive to the cultural needs of racial minority communities. We are so appreciative of the attention that the second draft of the calendar shows to the distinct needs of our community on issues of calendar. We don't expect that the school calendar in the Ithaca City Schools or in any district in a place where our minority is gonna fully accommodate the calendar we would have drafted if it were created around our community's own internal calendar. But that's not the expectation we have, nor the request we place. There are very specific days that carry exceptional weight for our community and being recognized as such and not being forced into a, pos a position of constantly having to negotiate that identity as something which somehow excludes you from the society writ large is something that, that really makes us feel that we have a home, not just here in Ithaca, but in a broader society, which in recent years, as we're all aware, has not always been so embracing of minorities. So thank you for that. And I hope that as you weigh these two drafts that that carries in your consciousness. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Richard Rosenfield. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to address uh, the school board. Um, I was made aware of the issue of the conflict between the school calendar and uh, the Jewish high holidays by Rabbi Safman. And I want to uh, just uh, say that her feelings are very much akin to my own. Um, I want to also say that I'm pleased as she was, uh, to see that you've, you're considering a second uh, calendar, a second uh, uh, modification of the calendar, and that it will go a long way to making a um, uh, uh, making accommodations for for the Jewish community. I think it's so important for communities that have different cultural values to try to to find ways to work together. And I want to uh, let you know, if you don't already, that a year ago, in December of 2019, I sang here with your holiday concert um, with the youth chorus and orchestra and the uh, Ithaca Chamber Orchestra, um, doing, bl blessing the holiday candles, the, the Hanukkah candles and singing a song um, with the entire chorus and the orchestra. And it was a real joy to see that different holidays can be celebrated together, um, that the whole community can come together for something like this. And I'm hopeful that as uh, this calendar has brought to your attention the needs to consider all the different uh, uh, components of our of our uh, diverse 
community um, that 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 as we move into the future that these considerations will be um, kept in mind and we'll all be able to have a bright future together. Look forward to this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And we have two folks online, I believe. Yes, and the first is Joshua Stone. Hello. Hi. Yeah, um, this is Joshua, or as I go by, J.T. Stone. Um, I'm actually a 2020 graduate of Ithaca High School, so it's nice to see some of you guys again. Um, I would like to discuss today the topic of mental health and mental illness. Um, just recently, I produced a two-part two series for WRFI Community Radio, where I interviewed eight local students about their experiences with mental health and mental illness. And one thing that I was really sort of shocked to learn is just the variety and the, you know, the the severity of their illness, you know, their illnesses in the community. And one thing that many of them brought up is that they wish that they learned more about mental health and mental illness in school, whether it be middle school or high school. And that's something that I know I never really thought about. And so I really wanted to ask the board as a whole, um, generally, what is the mental health curriculum from pre-K to high school um, and where I could be directed to, um, you know, for more information about that online. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic and I've emailed all of you the link to that, that series um, in case you wanna see what the students themselves have to say about their mental illnesses and how they think we as a society and a school district um, can help address these issues. Uh, I thank you guys for your time. It's great to see you, JT. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll have border responses and, uh and an answer to, to your question in just a few minutes. And we have Stephen Manley. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Stephen Manley. I am the executive director of the Ithaca Public Education Initiative or IPEI, and I come to you tonight to share uh, some information about our grants program uh, that we have recently approved. For the past 25 years, IPEI has been a hyper-local nonprofit dedicated to raising funds within the community to meet our teachers, students, and schools' needs as they provide them to us. Last month in March, uh, we funded eight red and gold one-time requests for up to eight, up to $500, five teacher grants, which are partner programs that bring experts uh, from the community and the world into our classrooms, uh, sometimes in real, in real time and other times virtually. We funded five of those and we funded a larger request for a Connecting Classrooms grant at Caroline Elementary to work with the team and the leaders uh, and growers at Gordlandia to bring a gourd tunnel and seedlings uh, now and into the future for Caroline. Uh, together, that totals just about $13,000 in funding just in March to meet teacher needs. This year, we've provided funding in the area of $30,000 for various projects and programs in every school in the Ithaca City School District including meeting requests which were made in early March of last year uh, that were never acted on. And we're excited to see them happen uh, in real life this spring. I'm bringing this up and today tonight to you to share that we can only do this work with the support of an amazing community of philanthropists, large and small, who make gifts to IPEI, which we make available to the Ithaca City School District staff, students, and schools. This $31,000 number does not even include the over $12,000 in awards we'll present to students and teachers towards the end of this year, and the $25,000 that we'll present to the Ithaca City School District, and with your support and the support of the Discovery Trail, send all of our students virtually this year 
and God willing next year in person to sites along the Discovery Trail as part of the Kids Discover the Trail Ithaca program, KDT Ithaca. So tonight I'm inviting you uh, this weekend to join us, to join IPEI, to join me in a small tent. You can even see me in person uh, on the commons uh, and receive in your email as a participant in our IPEI scavenger hunt, a list of clues to take you through downtown, introducing you to some of the sites and architecture and items and pieces of culture that you may walk by daily or weekly and not know are there, learning something about Ithaca, this place we call home, having a chance to get out of your house in a safe and social distant manner, and also helping raise funds for IPEI's continued existence as a resource to the Ithaca City School District. All the information and how to register can be found at IPEI.org. That's IPEI.org. And we do have options for individual registration, family pod or pair registration, and a pay what you can option. We want everyone to be involved with us and everyone to be involved with IPEI and learning more about their community. Thanks for your time. I look forward to seeing you out on the hunt. And I'm excited to share that we have been given permission by the city to host a small tent to help you and give you hints the day of the event on the commons with our masks on, come and look for us. Thanks for all you do for the students and the schools. Thank you, Steve. Thank, Thank you, you, IPI. And where I believe uh, we have one yes, more. We have one more, uh, Auburn Siddle, who I believe may be in the same place as <laughs> Steve Manley. <laughs> I, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, yes, you just heard from my better half, but I'm actually here tonight um, on behalf of the Ithaca Elementary Outdoor Gear Project. Um, for those of you who don't know, we're a group of parents representing all eight elementary schools um, who came together early this fall in the height of the pandemic to commit to raising funds and equi equitably distributing those funds to support the outdoor learning needs of our elementary schools. Um, this was a need that was initiated and kind of we were convened by the eight elementary school principals who very much wanted to keep um, our school doors open this winter and keep our learners outside. Um, and so I'm here to announce that we're really excited that we've raised about $60,000 so far and purchased um, over a thousand sets of rain gear, um, over 400 and almost 500 pairs of boots, um, winter boots. Um, 400 pairs of snow pants and almost 600 pairs of mittens. And that includes outfitting all of the in-person learners at Enfield and BJM elementary schools and at Fall Creek as well. Um, we'd love to come give you a formal update with teachers and maybe a principal, um, perhaps as part of the agenda in the next meeting or two. We know you have super busy schedules and a lot of business to do, but I think it could be um, a great way to learn more about what teachers are doing with all of this gear. Um, these are classroom sets of gear. This is not gear that's getting sent home to parents, but rather we view them as learning tools. Um, and we would love to also continue a conversation with uh, the district about how we can help institutionalize support for outdoor learning, um, especially at the elementary level where we have so much momentum um, and excitement from both our school building leadership as well as teachers who um, are excited to get our, our littlest people outside to learn. So thank you all um, and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation about this. Thank you, Auburn, the outstanding. Uh, look forward to seeing you and others uh, shortly, soon uh, in front of us, in front of the whole board. But uh, that's it for everyone. I believe that is spoken, correct? Uh, there's no more. So this is an opportunity for board responses to public comment. So we'll open it up for anyone who wishes to speak on the board side. I'll, I'll start I, on the issue of the calendar. Um, I am very glad to see a second draft and I was not aware of it until um, even though I have it in front of me, I didn't notice it until the rabbi mentioned it. Um, so I'm very glad that we have that to consider. 
And so we'll be talking about that later in the meeting. Um, and thank you for both Robert and Rabbi Saffron for being here um, to share your perspective uh, with us on the issue, which uh, we received comments through Let's Talk. And I was um, pre preparing my thoughts on how I might suggest redrafting the calendar. And it looks like somebody else <laughs> beat me to it. Um, and then uh, let's see, um, a JT on the mental health uh, issues. It's certainly something that uh, we talk about all the time um, and even more so uh, during this pandemic. And I think that uh, we, we have some uh, folks who are prepared uh, from our administrative staff who can answer in more detail your questions about mental health curriculum and where you could access information about it. And, you know, thank you very much for the work that you're doing in this very, very important field. And uh, Steve, uh, sa scavenger hunt sounds great. And uh, we always appreciate all of the many, many projects that have been funded by IPEI over the years. Um, I was a little unclear when the scout is the scavenger hunt. Are you going to be on the commons Saturday or Sunday or both? Um, and, uh, or, you know, are people doing this, uh, whenever they have the chance, once they get the information, um, and, uh, Auburn, the, the information about what you've done with raising money, um, and, uh, and, and starting a real movement to, uh, as you say, institutionalized outdoor education, outdoor learning. Uh, back in the fall, uh, I was out um, on a nice day up at Bell Sherman, and I was really, really impressed with seeing what the students were doing with their outdoor spaces and the gear that they now are have access to will enable them to continue it. And, uh, and I'd like to see uh, that innovation continue um, even once we are allowed to be indoors all the time. We don't need to be indoors all the time. Uh, I think a lot of us have come to appreciate uh, spending time outdoors even when uh, the weather is not ideal. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. Well said. Appreciate that. Um, other board members, and I would ask that uh, we just give JT a, a quick, a few directives. Yeah. Um, that would be great for all board members. Think or whenever you're ready, Ms. Grove is ready to answer. Thank you. JT, thank you for all of your work. Can you hear me? There we are. JT, thank you for all of your work in, in reaching out. I would welcome a meeting in the very near future. I'm at Mary Dot Grover at ICSD so that we can meet with myself, Jennifer Gondek, and Carrie Burke, who are working right now very closely with mental health teams across all of our buildings to center student voice on what they need. And I'm sure you will have lots of insights to that given your interviews and how we can plan to best support students this spring, summer, and going into next year. So please, please reach out. We can meet next week. There you go. Thanks, Mary. Other board members? Right. So to the rabbi and your colleague, thank you. Just want to uh, make sure you both appreciate and that we are reminded that it was our students who really, let's just say, kicked us about this. Um, back when we were all seeing each other in person, I hope you know that a bunch of uh, fourth graders came to us and made a pretty intense presentation about how our calendar 
was not respectful of all cultures. And that really, I'm not gonna say it got the ball moving because this is a long-standing conversation, but our superintendent has made it clear. When our kids have voice and choice and they come for us, that's when we're gonna see the most movement, right? Across a broad spectrum of issues. So thank you, but let's give credit to our little people. Some of them probably barely came over this stage, so more power to them. Um, to JT, <clears throat> you've always been extremely conscientious, so thank you for continuing your work. And I'll say just like many issues that this pandemic has brought to the forefront, we had an inkling of the need uh, three or four of us when I've been attending some uh, some presentations and conferences again before everything uh, went sideways about the need and we had brought that need back to our executives and we had met with the psych psychiatric maybe that's not the right word the psychological staff at the high school to get their on the ground impressions of what was really taking place and we knew there was a a, a gap even then in the need, and they were the ones to, to tell us up front. Um, we weren't bringing the appropriate amount of attention and resources to the problem. Like our now clear understanding of our technological needs out in rural issues, like our now understanding of our food insecurity in our community, this is now another issue that we are certainly um, very clear how we need to ramp up our, our service protocols and our investment in mental wellness. And, uh, you know, our executive team here has the vast, vastly more information about details than we will as a board. But let me just say, we hear you. And I think the whole world hears you, right? This is an issue that we can no longer um, pretend isn't close to the top of our priority. So hopefully soon we'll hear some reports from our executive team about what that actually looks like in practice. Thanks. Board members on the screen. Those that, that are, whoever wants to go next, Anne. Yeah, just uh, again, very happy to have a second draft of the uh, calendar for all the reasons everybody's already stated. And JT, thank you so much for bringing, it is such an important issue. So I'm really glad you're working on it and bring it to the board. And I just want to uh, say uh, one thing about the uh, Outdoor Gear Project. I think it's just a fantastic project. And I know that from my own perspective, I think it would be great to see um, the kind of outdoor education that took place this year. That it was, I think it's an incredibly inspired project um, that, and bringing, <laughs> getting all those kids outside and integrating learning with being in, in the outdoors. So that is, I'm just, thank you so much for working on that. And, I look forward to uh, you know another meeting where we can have um, even even more of a presentation on it. Um, so thank you, and also I'm very excited about your scavenger hunt IPEI. So and thank you for all the phenomenal projects uh, that you support. Thanks, Anne. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, folks. Um, to Rabbi Softman and uh, Richard, thank you so much for um, actually your collaborative. Um, and considerate words, because Eldred spoke to it, we have been, you know, kind of mentally stuck with moving this forward. And I'm going to really be brief, but my hope is one day we can recognize all communities with our calendar and serve the needs of everyone in an equitable manner and not have to choose so dividedly moving forward in the near future. Um, I think we're making progress. I know we're, we've definitely not arrived yet, but I think with collaboration and some sacrifice, we, we can definitely get there. But thank you for uh, everything you shared today. And I totally agree with all of you, with both of you, with what you shared. Uh, JT, uh, thank you for your bravery and your dogged determination. I think it's a um, huge, huge undertaking that you're focused on, but it's extremely needed. And you know, we know with this pandemic, it's been only exacerbated with the need for our kids with mental health. Um, please reach out to Mary so we can um, work together and collaboratively. And we know that we can start making necessary progress. And Auburn, 
I'm never, you mentioned that we may be too busy to hear you share um, about the outdoor gear project. I'm never too busy to hear about something great like that. I love the fact that our kids are outdoors and the, you know, the numbers you were throwing out there are just truly impressive. So please, when you are ready to present, I am, I will change my schedule around and definitely be there to hear it. So thank you. Want anything? Um, don't have to respond. I mean, we, we have students to go yet. Yeah, go ahead. My sentiments have been covered, I think, by my colleagues' um, right. uh, remarks. I, I will just say that um, I belong to a religious denomination that follows the Gregorian rather than the Julian calendar. And so um, I have been dealing with this for the last 35 years in you know my own little way. Uh, but I will say that uh, my religious holidays fall on the same calendar dates every year. And I just uh, Googled what's going to be happening with just um, Rosh Hashanah <laughs> for the next five years. And you get a pretty wide berth there. <laughs> and so this year there was a there was a, a conflict with Labor Day, which also changes every year um, where there's a minor adjustment. But um, for the next four years, I, I don't see the, a, a lining up with anything that we uh, that that we currently recognize. And it's a it's a major work in progress and um, at least acknowledging dates of importance um, to all religious groups that we know um, is a it's an important step. And I. Uh, we got a lot of comments on this one issue with with regard to the calendar, and um, I am pleased to see the second draft as well. And um, thank thank everyone else for their comments. Thanks, Pat. Anyone else? Are we good? Um, good to go on to student reps. And not hearing anything, so I think we can go ahead and. Uh, according to our agenda, it will be student reps have an opportunity to uh, update the board. And they are not here, they are online, I believe. Hello. Um, so uh, as JT mentioned in his public comments, um, mental health uh, continues to be a struggle for students as we enter this uh, home stretch of the school year um, and it's not going away anytime soon. Um, and so we also feel that it would be beneficial for students and teachers if the district uh, were to develop and implement a mental health curriculum that students can take with them from elementary school through high school uh, so that they may, may be better supported uh, during their time at ICSD and better prepared for life beyond high school. Um, before this meeting, I also intended uh, to raise an objection to the um, first draft of the academic calendar. Uh, however, when prepping for this meeting, um, I was very relieved uh, to see the second draft uh, in the agenda. Um, so I would like uh, to thank you guys for uh, listening to the requests made by Rabbi Safin in the community um, and changing uh, the academic calendar to accommodate uh, ICSD's Jewish community. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, over the years, I've had to miss um, a lot of school uh, for Jewish calendar or for Jewish holidays, um, and I'm very relieved that um, many kids will not have to miss their first day of school next year. Um, uh, to what um, Anne said, uh, all of the holidays um, since since the Hebrew calendar doesn't quite match up with the Julian or Gregorian calendars, um, the holidays kind of like move backwards in the in our normal calendars like every year and then um, every so often there's a leap year and everything moves forward a month and then the cycle repeats um, so uh, it may it may seem a little random but every, every I think five or so years uh, we might end up in a similar position uh, but thank you for uh, taking our holidays into account and making the necessary changes Um, so a couple of weeks ago in a student council meeting, a student, um, Madison McFall, spoke about her experiences 
with disability accommodations in general, but more specifically at IHS. Um, personally, I thought her points opened my eyes to issues I hadn't really previously considered. So we thought that this was something that the board and the community would benefit from hearing. So we reached out to her and we have a letter from her, which I will read out. Um, so quote, hi, my name is Madison McFall. I'm in 11th grade. I've been in a wheelchair since fourth grade. The reason why I'm writing to you um, is because since fourth grade, I have felt excluded when it comes to school, but more importantly in Ithaca High School. The ways I feel excluded are that in the bathroom, there's not a sink that is wheelchair friendly. Handicap stalls are always locked and I have to use the nurse's bathroom, which is not near any of my classes. In addition, the handicap buttons never work. Students that don't have a disability use the handicap doors um, and teachers don't say anything about it. York Lecture Hall is very non-inclusive and the courtyard isn't handicap friendly. It seems as if the school doesn't use money for purchases that we actually need. We just use the money to make the school shiny and new. I think someone, either the principal or even myself, should maybe say something to the students uh, at the assembly on the very first day of school every year about not using the handicap doors for the personal use. Also, the class trips aren't inclusive when it comes to the students who are disabled. The reason why I'm writing this now is because I'm tired of having to deal with these obstacles. I'm not the only student at um, this school who has a disability and I don't want any future students to have to go through this. Thank you for your time, unquote. Um, um, during the past few weeks, students and teachers at IHS have been actively working towards anti-Asian racism awareness in our school. Um, although the Atlanta shooting happened a month ago, we cannot just move on from it. Um, and similar tragedy, tragedies that AAPI community has and continues to face. Um, a team of teachers spearheaded by Brian Kane planned a town hall virtual meeting facilitated by Evelyn, a senior, and me and two AAPI teachers, Ms. Marolia and Ms. Jewett, on the Friday before break. Um, we held this space for IHS students who are part of the AAPI community. Um, I guess it's like the affinity group. Um, about 20 students joined and we had important conversations sharing personal experiences and discussing ways to address anti-Asian sentiment and violence in our school and community. Um, some ideas that were brought up were curriculum changes to include more Asian American history and people in our classes, um, having more conversations at school, like acknowledging and discussing the racism that all minorities face and um, teacher training on diversity and inclusion. Um, these are all just ideas, but it would be great if the I, our district could take these into account. Um, I thought this meeting was very successful and many students felt heard and are motivated to continue this discussion with the wider IHS community. Um, we plan to have a second town hall meeting soon with the entire school. Um, Evelyn and I are also in the process of creating a club of AAPI students and allies to discuss ways we can bring more attention towards addressing anti-Asian hate in our own school. Um, we hope to work together with the IHS administration and the Board of Education to include, um, to work together and uh, generate more ideas to include Asian Americans and other people of color in anti-racist education and policy. Um, we also met with Dr. Anna Kells, an assembly member of the New York State legislation um, of our district and Ms. Amy Somchan Havmavong, um, the director of the Ithaca Asian American Association um, to discuss our work with anti-Asian racism awareness in IHS and to collaborate in addressing racism against the AAPI community in our district. Um, it was really good and they offered their support and resources in our efforts to increase awareness of anti-Asian hate and violence in our school. Um, 
here is the link to the um, the website and it has some really good resources if you want to continue to educate and just learn about this topic. Um, uh, I also appreciate uh, that Ms. Grover reached out after the last board meeting to discuss what ICSD is doing with anti with the anti-marginalization curriculum. Um, and I'm grateful that our district is working towards this anti-racist education, but of course there's more work to be done. So I and the whole AAPI community at IHS look forward to the continued inclusion of Asian Americans in anti-racism discussions and initiatives at our school district. Recently, new committees such as the learning models and learning forward committees were made to plan for the next year. We are aware that there are similar groups made last year before the current school year, but we are wondering if the groups this year would be any different. Um, to what level would these committees influence our future school year? It seemed last year's suggestions that the committee made weren't necessarily incorporated into this school year plan. Um, to reiterate, will the role and impact of these committees be any different from last year? We've been lucky enough to participate in similar meetings at the IHS, such as the IHS Grading Committee and the IHS Attendance and Engagement Committee, where student conversations. We are wondering if these committees will work similarly in terms of student involvement. Also, we recently became aware that there is an upcoming board member elections. Um, and we have a few questions about that. First, how does the process of voting slash the elections work? Um, to what extent can community members get involved? And is the board planning on publicizing these elections? We, uh, um... Thanks, Emma. We were just having a, a bit of a technical near glitch, but uh, it was quickly fixed on our end. But we certainly heard uh, heard your questions. So, uh, so board responses. Anything? I'll try to to go quick, um, Emma. In regards to the board elections, um, they are widely publicized. Uh, there'll be a number of organizations that I would presume would have um, candidate forums um, in addition to the board budget um, or the school district budget, which we'll be talking about this evening. So uh, there will be a mailer that goes out to all, um, I want to say registered voters, uh, Dr. Brown, but it may be every home in the district that is on record or at least on the um, Bureau of Elections. And so there'll be a great deal of information about the upcoming board elections and plenty of opportunities for um, folks to be involved. And it may even be um, consideration for, uh, for lack of a better word, a student forum this year as well, right? But I know the Village of Ithaca traditionally has one, the League of Women Voters traditionally has a forum um, and or other organizations as well. So uh, I'll ask Ann only because I know Ann is um, in petition mode and the petitions are due on what day? What's the question? Petitions due. Oh, uh, it's April 28th. So we won't know we won't know which board candidates are running until April 28th, and then we'll have an idea of who's running for election. Uh, but we'll be voting um, hopefully on a budget this evening, so folks will know um, what the budget they'll also be voting on, including any possible um, tax levy. Um, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Grace again. Uh, Grace, I may have mentioned it last time, maybe I did not. Um, before COVID, the district was engaged in a critical ethnic studies um, committee, which included a number of race scholars um, that were trying to develop curriculum uh, about how to get outside of teaching a standard European form of not just history, but English, physics, you name it. Um, that Again, that committee was disrupted because of COVID, but in having a conversation with Dr. Brown, we are trying to restart that committee um, with scholars from Cornell, Ithaca College, uh, and I believe we had scholars from Binghamton University as well. So we're trying to make that happen and completely agree 
Um, for those folks who had the privilege of hearing Jason Reynolds today, uh, his talk was um, inspiring and realizing that without question, we have to expand and broaden our curriculum. Um, and as a Black Studies faculty member, uh, I, I obviously believe that as well. Um, the calendar, I'll hold my comments till until we get to the calendar. It's a complicated issue. Um, there's no doubt that there's times in which we're able to provide um, some accommodations for much needed communities and there's other times that we're not. Um, we have at no point in time provided a day off for the lunar calendar. Um, the first, uh, the lunar new year, excuse me. The first um, edition provided um, Juneteenth off for students, but did not provide Juneteenth off for faculty, right? So the first time that that's become New York state law. Um, complicated that we're not able to provide off any days for students who are Muslim um, and the festival of aid of breaking fast. And so it's a complicated process and we're also, dictated some by New York state law, but we're going to continue to try to push as far as we can to be innovative and creative and support as um, many of our students as we possibly can. Um, and uh, Alex, I apologize. I did not hear who the letter was from. Can I, is it possible to hear the name one more time? Yeah, it was Madison McFall. I can also. So Madison, thank you greatly. Um, this is a topic that a number of us have been thinking about for quite some time, um, particular as we engage in the capital project where we're doing renovations and or additions to buildings. Um, one of the constant conversations is thinking about um, bathrooms and um, I know uh, Aaron Croyle has joined us in some of these conversations about um, how we do bathroom design is just one example. How do we use universal design as an opportunity to make all of our spaces uh, much more accessible and um, much more affirming to a, a host of students. And so it's a reminder for us to continue those conversations. Um, and as we're just redesigning spaces, um, this is not an issue of resources. This is an issue of both creativity and imagination, and we'll continue to push that. So thank you greatly to Madison, and thank you greatly for reading that letter, and we'll continue to, to push in that direction. Thank you, Sean. Well said. You touched on all the topics. Any anyone else right now? I, I want to add to go off what Sean said, um, Alexander and Madison. Thank you. And Madison, if you're listening or if you can pass on the word, I would love to hear more from a student who who is living this, so we can incorporate what a student has to say. You know, universal design for movement and learning is so critical. And I think it kind of plays off of, um, you know, what Grace was talking about as well. I, I, I work in the disability field. And so often we talk about the silos that we face. So in disability, you'll have a Down syndrome silo and a cerebral palsy silo and this silo and that silo. And we get so caught up in our own noise that we're not working together enough. And I think as we look at our anti-racist practices and teaching, we can incorporate, and we do incorporate, but maybe we can do better incorporating all races and looking at the anti-ableist issues, you know, looking at ableist issues that we see, you know, there's so much work to be done. And the nightmare that we live in constantly with, with the violence, just because someone isn't white, I, I, it, it is appalling and, and, and I am sorry. As, I, I, I'm just sorry, yeah, it's awful. So I, I, I just hope you keep bringing these things up and I, I hope that we can continue to do better and, and change the world and work together to, to start locally in doing that. Anyone else right now? Uh, yeah, just a couple of really quick comments, Grace. Really appreciate, um, that I, uh, let me start again, Grace. I'm truly appreciative that you have been proactive in reaching out to find out the information that we began to discuss in great detail at our last meeting. Um, thank you for not waiting for it to come to you because sometimes in this complicated district that could take a while. Again, Alex Madison. Alex, thank you for reading. Madison, thank you for writing. I tell you, I've been really, um, taken aback by how bathrooms look different when they're designed for people in wheelchairs 
New York State is must have started implementing um, the same kind of changes along the interstate because I've stopped at a few rest stops in the last several months. And I'm just astounded how low the sink is. I'm astounded how uh, large the handicapped stall is when they're redesigned. And uh, these are things we take for granted as, as able-bodied people, but um, looking forward to those changes being implemented in our schools so our students similarly situated can feel comfortable and feel that um, the schools really belong to them. Thanks, that's all I have to add. Thanks, the uh, well said by students, well said by board members. Uh, anything else? Well, um, if not, we'll, uh, we'll roll. And thanks everyone, thanks for your comments uh, and the updates and, and the public um, outstanding uh, dialogue. Let's, uh, if we can, let's roll on to the consent agenda, which has no modification of the infield geothermal piece, but other than that, it's fairly straightforward. Um, if we could have a motion and second, and then any questions, and we can roll. I'll move the consent agenda as presented. Second. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Pat. Any questions regarding the consent agenda by board members? Not a question, but I know that there is um, a personnel report that includes uh, a number of retirements, and I'm looking forward to the time that we can honor the longstanding service of a number of our teachers who have been um, just stalwarts in our district. So thank you for your service. Greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Sean. Um, if nothing else at this time, if we'll call the roll, Tricia, please. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Aaron Croyle? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Nicola Fave? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Ann Reichlin? Yes. Pat Wazalu? Yes. Thank you all. Dr. Brown? It is, uh, it, it is time, so let's, um, your, your time, and then we'll roll into uh, a variety of business items. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Ainsley, and it's good to see you all in person. First, and very importantly, um, a special shout out and a thank you to the folks who were able to make this in-person and virtual meeting happen. Um, Daphne Shalulu is in the house. Thank you, Daphne, for your leadership. Peter Stromberg, Paul, Zach Lynn, and very importantly, Emily and Tricia, who have been scrambling and working. What we've gone through here has been uh, in many ways stressful and hard. And it's been a note for me to think about what our teachers are doing every single day. Um, so I wanna send a shout out to all the educators who are doing this virtual, in-person and simultaneously virtual teaching and learning every single day. Because with our team of folks, and I'm surrounded, I just had to show up and, 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 sound, and sound cool. These folks have been doing work for the last week to prepare for this. And I wanna say thank you for your leadership. And a thank you to all the folks who are doing this every single day. It's not easy. Uh, secondly, you know, in, even in the midst of all the challenges we've been facing um, as a school district and as a community, there are special days like today. Uh, Dr. Evie Bradwell mentioned earlier, yeah, we had Jason Reynolds. We had one of the best authors in the world um, in our space today, in our learning spaces. Jason spent time with our students. Jason spent time with our educators. And on Thursday evening at seven o'clock, Jason will spend time with our community. Um, also on that panel will be uh, President Shirley Collado, Dr. Sean Everly Bradwell, a principal from New York City, and myself, we will be engaging in a conversation Thursday. And I'll send the board and the community a link to that. But again, it was a special day. Jason is a world-renowned author, uh, a New York Times bestseller. He's won multiple awards. He's the Library of Congress's youth ambassador. Um, he spoke to our young people and our and adults today in ways that I have not seen in a long time. It was one of those special, special days. And again, we will send the recording out to the board so you will have an opportunity to hear from him as well if you, if you want to live today. With that, I want to transition to much that's happening on Friday afternoon at five o'clock, which has been consistent and typical for our great Empire State. We received some new guidance. So on the last day of our spring break at 5 p.m., we received new and updated information about uh, how to do in-person learning. I'm gonna uh, ask Ms. Talkett to share some of our thinking, where we are right now, and what this new guidance and information means for us um, coming from the New York State Department of Health. 
morning, everyone. Good to see those of you who are in person and also those of you who are joining us virtually. I'm Lily Talcott, and I get to serve as the deputy superintendent and also as the COVID-19 coordinator. So we received this updated guidance from the New York State Department of Health, which essentially adopts the CDC's recommendation of transitioning from six feet of physical distance to three feet. Um, certainly with some caveats, also adopts the CDC's different leveling systems um, and recommendations in accordance with community spread um, that's taking place. Um, and um, it also um, indicates that there, there's no longer a need for the use of polycarbonate barriers. And so obviously our community likely knows that we have already talked about this transition to greater in-person learning for our pre-K through five students and welcoming more students back. Our educators have been phenomenal. Huge shout out to our in-person elementary staff, everyone um, involved. Our, our principals are working with our teams of, of teachers and education support professionals now in order to welcome those students back in the coming weeks. We're looking for a date around um, April 26th to welcome those students back. Um, and in the meantime, with secondary, we continue to uh, work with our secondary remote teachers, um, given widespread vaccinations. Of course, we are, we're connecting with folks um, and seeing if there are any possibilities really for us expanding any in-person teaching and learning for our secondary students as well. So we're still in the process of doing that and really navigating that um, in, in a way that supports our educators and supports our students. Um, so that's where we are right at the moment. Dr. Brown, would you like to add anything or have me add anything in addition? I think that's good. Thank you so much. Fabulous, thank you. Any quick question from the board before we transition to funding requests, budget? All right. I stood up because I cannot present a budget with my back turned to some folks. So I'm, I hope you don't mind me standing up. So I'm gonna try my best to, and if you cannot see the screen, let me know and tell me to move. I'm gonna try to pigeonhole myself into this little corner right here so that I can see you, you can see me, and we can also see the screen. Um, and if you can go back to that first image there, Emily. There we go, go there. Yeah, start there, there we go. So we always start on, this is uh, my, this is the 11th funding request I presented to the Board of Education. And each and every time we start with this, well, a cool image, but we start with this first slide here. I would not present a budget um, with this slide being the first one that we didn't feel would meet the needs of our learners. I will tell you now that this budget and this funding request that we're putting in front of you tonight and hopefully in front of our community going forward is one that we feel will meet our vision and mission to help us support the thinking for young people and adults in this community and allow for us to engage, educate, and empower, which is what we've been, we've become known for doing better than anybody else. We're best in class at doing that. And we would, and I would not have this slide here as the first one if I didn't feel like this budget would do just that. And there have been tough, tough years when we've had to make some significant reductions to our budget, but even when we made those significant reductions to the budget and staffing and FTE, each time we felt like we were meeting the needs of our learners and this one, this budget will do the same. We always start with this one. This is 145, and no, it's not a round number, Bob. It's $145,179,885 funding request. And folks will see, I have a trend here showing how budget is growing from year to year. We'll see um, a, a percentage increase that's more significant than what we've seen in the past. We're gonna talk about why that is and what's driving that number and what's behind that. Again, this year's budget process has been a year long process, probably more so than any other process we've been a part of in my 11 years here. We started talking about budget, this year's budget last May, March in April, knowing that we had to plan for the future and a future that has been more and more uh, unpredictable as we speak. So this budget that we're putting in front of our community as of this time is at that number, you see the increase from year to year. This is what folks always wanna hear about, the tax levy increase from year to year. You'll see our trends here. The funding request we're putting forward has a tax levy increase. And then the second, Amanda Verbal, who explains this better than anybody in New York State, is going to talk about the difference between the tax levy and the tax rate. But the tax levy for us is going to be a 2.96% increase from year to year. That is at the tax levy limit. That is a tax levy limit. We are not proposing to go above the tax levy limit this year. We're proposing to go to the tax levy limit 
which is at 2.96%. So how does that translate into a tax rate? For us, this number, we always start here. You know, we am almost certain now, we are the only school district in New York State that has had a tax rate go down for this many consecutive years. We are estimating and anticipating our tax rate going down again. Amanda, while folks are looking at this chart and wondering why there's so much red on there, can you talk about the tax levy tax rate difference? understood that um, we as a we are able to levy taxes that is revenue for us so revenue is monies that we bring in to our school district that we then turn to support our operations and so the levy amount is a as dr brown mentioned it is within um, the what's called the uh, cap formula the tax cap formula so we input data into a formula that is driven by the state, given to us by the state, and we calculate an amount of money that will then be spread across all of the taxing, uh, taxable entities in our community. That includes homeowners, businesses, right? All of the, anyone that would pay taxes, that levy amount is spread across those folks. And so because we, are an ever-growing community. We have wonderful development here. We always have new hotels and uh, new places for people to live, right? The more shoulders that can carry the burden of that levy amount, that's what equates to the rate, right? So that levy is spread across all the folks that are able to pay those taxes and pay those taxes. And that actually gives us then the ability to set a rate. And that is why we continue to see our tax rate go down because we have many more shoulders to carry that burden each year. It's outpacing the growth of the levy, okay? And so communities around us don't often see that. And Dr. Brown is right, we are pretty unique, mainly because we're insulated by the university system and the college systems that we have here. We always have growth and development. We're very popular in terms of um, people coming to visit here uh, for recreation purposes. And so there's a lot of um, insulation to our community. Um, other communities where you've seen population decreases, right? You will see tax rates go down. When you see businesses closing, uh, you will see tax rates go down, um, go, go up, I'm sorry for them. For us, our tax rate goes down. Now, one point to make, um, we do not set your assessed value. So if your home is assessed, that is actually done through Tompkins County Department of Assessment. And so um, when you get your bill, you're gonna see the amount of money that you pay per thousand will be going down. But if your house was reassessed, your bill amount may go up from one year to the next, but the rate by which it's calculated is, is determined to go down. Thank you, Ms. Berba. Shout out to Brad Granger, because I think Amanda is much even better than Brad used to be for 10 years. Ah, uh, yeah. So what I tried to capture here was what that would look like when Amanda talked about um, what your tax, your taxes will look like on a, your home. Here's a, an image and a chart we typically share. Again, that's a red number. That's a good thing when your tax bill is going to be reduced from year to year. And those numbers are anticipated reductions to your tax bill if you have not been reassessed. The first, you know, a red number on a chart is a good thing sometimes. And with that, you know, again, that increase from year to year, that 6% increase from year to year, that number is coming, that, that significant increase is coming because of these drivers. We have contractual obligations, salary increases, uh, benefit increases, and you see those on the screen. Those are significant dollars we've committed. Um, we, we, we entered into a six-year agreement with a couple of our bargaining units. We're in other, bar, we're in other agreements that are lengthy, and we've committed to those kind of salary and increases to healthcare and benefits. And that number you see there on the screen represents that. COVID-19 staffing, yes, we did need to increase the number of FTE in this school district last year. We are unique as an organization across multiple sectors. We did not lay folks off. We actually expanded our payroll and we maintain our level of offerings. We needed to, our young people needed that, our community wanted that, we did so. That did come at a cost, um, some staffing costs. We anticipate 
continuing some of that staffing increase in next year. We have young people coming back to us. We have some needs that we need to meet, some shifts we need to make. We what we call it is COVID-19, we're coding as a COVID-19 staffing. There are some other non-personnel related COVID costs. As I said to my team today, hand sanitizer expense is expensive. Some of the stuff that we're doing to maintain an orderly and safe environment does come at a cost. And we're gonna talk about some of the federal dollars that are coming our way that we can use to offset some of these costs. But it's important for our community to know that we have been responding for a year and will continue to respond in the midst of this awful, awful pandemic. And we have the BOCES increases, which are annual increases year to year. Um, and we can talk later, if we've been talking about that over the months, we can talk more about what's embedded in that BOCES line. So just wanted to show folks where those dollars are. Those are, those, that's where the increase from year to year is coming. Capital project, yes, we, you can look around, you can see we're in the midst of phase one of our capital project improvements. We're entering into phase two. The planning is done. We're gonna start seeing some of that work happen now. We promised, um, how many roadshows are we going on? Dozens, we promised our community that we will do what we need to do over the next 10 years with this capital project and this, these capital improvements and keep it at around 7% of our total dollar, the debt service line, around 7% of our budget. We still, we have done that. And we're actually a little bit, but Amanda can speak more specifically, we're below that 7% dollar. But it's important for folks to know that our debt service line is a part of that $145 million. And we said that it would be around 7% of how much we spend overall in our general fund. And we are there. And at the same time, we are expanding and enhancing our facility. Here, now I'm gonna be asking uh, Ms. Grover and, and Ms. Talker to help us. So what are we getting with that 100? Rob always asks this question. So what are we gonna get for that 100, 100 plus million dollars? I remember the day when you said, oh, we're at 100 now. That's significant. Now we're at 145. We, our community asks and expects us to do a lot. And we are gonna do much. And we are eager and excited and looking forward to what's next in our school district, particularly when it comes to teaching and learning. You heard young people tonight speak about what they wanna see us do, what they wanna see us do more, what they wanna see us maintain. Maintain, we are prepared and positioned to do just that. We, uh, we are one of the most innovative school districts in the country, and we will continue to do that. And we're, gonna, we're calling it Learning Forward ICSD. And you know, we're gonna talk about what we mean by these key themes here. What are we doing to partner with our young people, students as partners and co-constructors of what we do with teaching and learning, curriculum development, assessment development. We're gonna talk about that some. What we're gonna be doing with our educators and the identity work. As we say often, it's important for us to understand who we are individually and how we show up in our learning spaces. And then how do we validate and affirm and build and bridge for the significant diversity that exists in our spaces. So the educator identity work is gonna be important for us going forward. We've allocated some significant funds for professional development to allow for that work to happen. Anti-racist curriculum for all, what does that mean? I stood here when we couldn't say the word anti-racism. Let's just be clear, I'm now part of a national commission that's putting out a vision for public education for the entire country. And this was the most debated topic right here. What can we call it? Is it anti-racism, anti-marginalization? Yes, we are going after what does it look like to cultivate an anti-racist school district? And what does it look like to have that experience for every educator and for every adult? I mean, for every educator and every student. We're gonna talk more about what that looks like. And then the support, the structures of support, what does it look like to enhance our community partnerships, professional development? What are we doing to, because to do what we're aspiring to do over the next five and 10 years, starting with this budget, it's gonna require us to enhance what we do and who we connect with inside and outside of our school district. So that, Ms. Talkett, I'm setting you up here, Ms. Talkett, Ms. Grover, and also literacy, if you can add in there what we're doing for literacy development, um, how, what, how we define literacy, what supports we're gonna put in place, all things that we've been embed embedding into this budget here. So Ms. Talkett maybe first and then Ms. Grover, talk a bit more. Hmm? Yeah, you see that first, that first element on the slide there, students as partners and leaders, a future student over there to the left, right? Um, so Learning Forward ICSD, there's a steering committee that's beginning. Emma talked a little bit about it during public comment and well, as well. And we, we meet officially starting this week, right? It's a group of about uh, 30 educators, about eight students. And we're certainly happy to welcome more students as well. And it's really gonna be guiding. Um, we're really asking our students to partner with us 
in both professional development and curriculum design formally, right? So we may have informally asked students to be a part of the process, right? And now we are systematizing it, right? We're trying to really hold ourselves accountable for, for really engaging with our young people and decentering dominant narratives as we do so, right? Educator identity work, we know that the most culturally responsive educators in our school district and throughout the, throughout the world, frankly, are those who truly know themselves and understand both their, un, their intersectional identities themselves, right, around race and class and gender expression and, um, and all, all of the layers, right, all of the layers of, of identity. Um, and how those show up in the classroom, how that identity interacts with um, my curriculum, with the staff that I work with, right? Um, and so we are, we're also partnering with um, a really fabulous organization called the Equity Consulting Group. It is run exclusively by women of color, and they're helping to partner with us to really guide us through much of this work as well. What's fabulous is the first thing, the first, their first order of business, right, is to interview and connect with students, right? So students as partners and leaders, they're really aligning with our vision, right? And have come to us with that um, as well, which is great. So they've met with, they met with iRISE students on Monday and are meeting with more students um, in the coming weeks as well. I'm gonna turn it over to Mary. She's gonna talk more explicitly uh, regarding the last two elements. Right. Yeah. Okay. So as we think about the anti-racist curriculum for all this component, I want to thank Grace for the report she gave at the beginning that is both our call to action and inspiration to continue to create interdisciplinary units of study that decenter the dominant narrative and support all of our students. And within that is a real commitment to literacy uh, inspired by the work of Dr. Goldie Muhammad. We just completed a book study, all of our administrators, to look at, at literacy in an equity framework that is comprised of five components, intellectualism, criticality, skills, joy, and that identity piece. And when we look at the skills, what, what are we doing in common across all of our elementary schools that's high quality first instruction that's supporting literacy and the skill of decoding, for example? And how is that connected and to students getting to know themselves as readers and writers and thinkers? So I'm really excited for our continued work on that. Then the structures and support. So we've heard, we've heard tonight from students on the needs of mental health for our whole community. And that's a, that's a piece, that's a structure. So what integrated mental health supports exist and what do we need to grow? What professional development do we need to extend? Um, we're grateful for the opportunities to have paid professional development af opportunities after school, as well as job embedded instructional coaching opportunities. Uh, the community partners that Dr. Brown spoke about, personalized learning, robust summer programming, and after school opportunities are, are part of those structures and supports. Thank you. So again, a budget that allows for the flexibility that's going to be needed for us to build and grow programs to support the evolving needs of our young people and to be prepared for the unexpected, which we've learned over the last 12 months or so that we need to be prepared. Um, again, a budget that will allow for us to meet our vision and mission. So key dates I heard earlier asked about the budget hearing. We, we hope to have the budget hearing on May the 11th. 
And we, the budget vote and board elections will take place on May the 18th. So again, a year round budget process, probably more of a, like a two year process for this particular budget. And this was just a bit of a summary. We welcome the board's questions, your thoughts, reactions, as we hope that you will adopt our request and we can take this to our community. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Um, we're, uh, that kind of wraps up Dr. Brown's comments and the comments from the exec team. And really we move on to um, really the next item is whether, uh, whether the board at this point is uh, ready to go ahead and um, adopt this budget. We've been at it for a while, a budget development, et cetera. The, the number that uh, we have in front of us is not a, not a surprise tonight. So it's really a question of what questions do the board have? Uh, does, sorry, does the board have regarding anything that's in the budgets? Um, obviously it's uh, what we vote on is, the, uh, is that final number, the 145 and change, uh, but um, we, don't, uh, we don't vote on where every single item goes. At this point, this is a proposed budget for 21-22. And as we know that uh, situation on the ground changes, and, uh, but we certainly, uh, there's resources here that uh, we uh, probably six months ago did not know that we would have. So uh, that changed our, uh, decisions that we have to make. Uh, and I think it's what has been built now is a budget that um, trying to provide for as many different contingencies as possible. So uh, I will only add that, Dr. Brown. Well so um, open it up for questions. And then obviously, if we are in agreement, uh, we can have a motion on um, adopting the budget as presented. Um, by our business officials and the exec team and the superintendent. Um, can I ask you a quick question? Um, we'll get the point in a minute. Um, it was one of the slides that was early on. You got to use your microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that. Um, but a uh, question for Amanda. In uh, one of the early slides, there was a 6%. There was a, that just a difference. And I just wanted to learn more about that and what it would be like next. Like, is this like a one time thing because of COVID? because of the specific needs that we have right now, or is this something in the future that would also be that? that that's a great question, Anne. Thank you for asking that, not just you know, for the board here, but also the community, right? So um, you will notice, and I think Dr. Brown mentioned it, right? That there is a jump this year that we haven't seen in years past. And so um, we've, we've done a lot of conversations at the finance committees um, and also, the most recent board uh, session that we had regarding um, the uniqueness of the budget this year. And we're, we're owning it. We are absolutely owning the fact that we are presenting the community a budget that includes and incorporates the ability to be agile. We learned a lot from this past uh, year um, I like to always try to, you know, live making lemonade out of the lemons, right? And so we know that there are things that we learned here that we have to continue to do um, that, that we learned during COVID um, are the imperatives, right? We need to make sure that we have the mental health supports. We need to ensure that we can do that when kids are present or when they're present either through a device, right? Um, we need to ensure that our staff are okay. Um, and that uh, we support them really, um, you know, like wraparounds, right? Um, and so this budget, that 6% increase that you're seeing there really is trying to determine um, sort of the, the pre-COVID way of teaching and learning and being a workplace. Um, the during COVID teaching and learning and being a workplace, which not was just in a sense of location, but a location uh, all over, whether it be in someone's, you know, living room or their bedroom or uh, their dining room table or their kitchen, or maybe even, you know, shared spaces with lots of other people. Um, and then the looking ahead, the what do we want to be, right? And so this budget incorporates a little bit of all of that 
And we do anticipate that we've built a budget that we most likely will not be spending all of that money because we, we know that there are things that we may not want to continue, but we may be forced to continue due to particular regulations, particular guidance documents um, that either are currently in place or yet to be seen. And so again, sort of that ability to um, create school by the definition that is ever evolving, um, we need a little bit of flexibility for that. The other part about this general fund budget, and that's what that's what voters, um, you know, are are giving their approval for, um, or disapproval for, is that right now we're putting all of the expenditures and also the new revenue, the federal revenue, into this general fund, so that it is very transparent uh, to the community, to the public, so that they know what we think it's going to take you know, to, as revenue coming in and then expenditures going out. What we will do um, during the course of the year is we learn more and get more guidance about how to manage the federal funds and how things need to be essentially, I'm using air quotes for those of you that can't see, coded, meaning how do we actually, where do we code it in the budget um, or in another fund to track it for auditing purposes and for reporting purposes, those things may shift. So next year, we might actually see a decrease or a very small increase to the general fund budget because we would have learned that some of these things need to be moved over to a different fund and we'll track it accordingly. So right now, we're owning that this incorporates a lot um, and, and it's incorporating things that are yet unknown and that we will ever evolve and also do everything we can to communicate that out as it happens like we've always been doing. Thank you. Um, could I just ask a, a follow up um, on the use of the federal funds? Um, because I think I, I want the community to be very clear that 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 six percent increase that we're seeing is not being complete. It's not being funded by additional revenues from the state. It is not, it's not being funded by any extraordinary tax levies that the, the school district is getting a chunk of money from the federal government. And I'm just looking at what's, what's in the, the documents um, that, it, that that money is, be, is now being, you're figuring it more for two to three years of spending rather than one spending. Um, a concern that I have over the budget ever since the last fiscal crisis was, um, you know, New York State vastly cut their uh, funding to school districts, and the federal government stepped in for one year, and one year only, and then we were deep in it. So, you know, the fiscal cliff was pushed off for another year, and then we kind of fell over it and had to do some drastic things with the budget. Uh, could you talk about how you're, you're going to use these funds and, and allocate them to attempt to mitigate any potential future uh, fiscal shocks to this community, many, many of whom can't take big fiscal shocks? Absolutely. So um, the reason why Dr. Brown says that we do year-round budgeting, and I think Rob also said, right, that this is not a surprise to anyone, is that we, we really stand by that commitment. We, you know, have monthly finance committee meetings and oftentimes even board development and work sessions where we are analyzing the long-range plan um, for the fiscal stewardship of the district, right? So um, since I came on board, we, we have a lot of tools and I know before me, there were a lot of tools that, um, that are out there and available, but we want to make them user-friendly and understandable and transparent, right? Posted and shared with the community to show not just, you know, what we're thinking about this year. This represents a moment in time study of what we believe we need for next year. I will be honest with you, and this is not to diminish the job that I have with the district and the entire business office team who are brilliant and all the stakeholders and all the budget developers. It is so easy to develop a budget from one year to the next. 
right? The challenge is when you're thinking ahead for that third year and that fourth year, when the monies, the federal monies, right, start to, they essentially will stop at that moment in time. So attached to this item in um, board docs, which is available to the public, there is a revenue sheet that we pulled together for you to show just to Pat's point, what is it essentially funding um, sort of that, you know, the $145 million. And so most of our money comes from the property taxes that, that um, we get, right, from, from our amazing taxpayers who support us and sort of say, this is who we want us to be, right? Um, state aid, that's the state portion of funds that are either reimbursed to us because of things that we do or monies that we spend, that they give us money on the dollar back, or a formula that they use to give money to districts across the state. That went up a little bit, Pat, to your point, and there's actually plans in the governor's budget for that to continue to go up and to be sort of funded at the level that we should have been funded all along. And then underneath that, so, so that's the tax levy and then the state, those are the major portions of the money that we're bringing in to drive the organization. Then we talk about the federal support. And the federal support, I tried to show everyone, there's a particular um, funding stream that was voted on in December that's called the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. That should be used over two years. And we show that we're using half of that money for this year to fund the operations okay, for next year. And then the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which was just passed you know, um, about a month ago, and that is um, supposed to be spent over three years. And so we're showing a third of that, okay? And just like every other year, then we balance the difference with the real revenue, the money that we know is coming in, and then how much we need for expenditures, we identify that gap and we have savings. The districts hold money in fund balances and reserves for particular expenses, right? So we're gonna be using a reserve to cover our retirement contributions. That's why we set that savings account up for that purpose. We'll be using um, some um, employee benefits reserve. When people retire, they get paid for benefits that they have accrued over time. We can use that reserve for that purpose. That's why we have it there, right? And then we have a fund balance, which is essentially a savings account that has sort of the, the rules are not as strict. They're, they're not for a particular purpose. And so we use that fund balance to balance our budget. And so that's how we sort of get to um, the monies that are able to support the budget moving forward. And there's other miscellaneous revenues and things there as well, but those are the major components. But what we'll do as soon as this budget is passed, we start the long range planning process. We, we plot this as next year, we know what this year is, we know what next year is, and then we chart factors. What does it mean? We put in all of our bargained agreements. We estimate what we think our benefits packages are gonna be. We look at what the, you know, the revenue um, situations and we balance that and we identify the gaps and we plan for it, right? We, we, we leverage funds that may not be going to things that we wanna continue and, and transfer them. We wanna be innovative, but we also want to maybe think about the traditions that we've always had that are no longer what we want to be anymore, right? So those are the things that we'll do. And that work is happening all the time. Thank you. Rob, I'd like to jump in real quick if I could. Um, Amanda, thank you for that um, the explanation. Um, I know Tricia has put into the chat a link to the revenue document. It'd be important for our community to take a look um, while we're talking about a 2.96% increase in real property tax. Um, there is a sizable increase in state aid that does not normally happen. Um, and again, it's sort of responsive to our current situation. There is a significant increase in federal aid that we know is short term. Um, and this is all while we have some um, other additional um, economic um, constraints and crises in our community. So local organizations who have had the furlough folks, um, people who have lost uh, jobs and revenue. And so I mentioned that because I think that's an important part for us to realize. Um, and as Amanda said, um, that means that as a school district, uh, our job is to do long-term budget planning, not simply to 
respond to a single or individual year. With that being said, I am also intrigued by what I witness in terms of friends, colleagues, um, and family who have watched housing assessment values increase significantly at the same time. So people trying to purchase property, and yet we find that the housing um, estimates or values of those homes has increased. And that helps explain some of the property tax value, particularly for a district like us, um, unlike most of our neighbors, where the vast majority of our budget comes from property tax dollars. Amanda, I say all that, and this is to say that as Rob asks us, what are we getting for the money that we pay for? And I would um, like to ask uh, our um, central administration team to respond a little bit more to JT's question about the resources that we are putting to make sure that our students um, have uh, access to resources for their mental well-being. So we know we can't talk in terms of specifics, but some of the things that we're going to be doing next year to ensure that we are responsive to um, the needs of our young people and mental well-being. Can we speak to that? That's what's included in this budget as well. Sure, very, very specifically, yeah. and this is a little bit helpful out here. We've added FTE. We added FTE in the current year, social working yeah. FTE, counseling FTE, and we plan to do some as part of this budget as well. So that's the big area. But that's, yeah, that's correct. And, and in addition, increasing our partnership with Tompkins County Community Health to really have uh, more support here on site for students. Um, that's been a wonderful, wonderful partnership. Additionally, there currently, um, there is a professional learning community group starting that uh, Jennifer Gondek and I will, will Jennifer Gondek really has done an amazing job bringing together the social workers and the school psychologists. And I do wanna take a moment to thank our staff, the school psychologists and social workers in our buildings who have been working to center student voice, integrate supports, that is going to need to continue and is, is really vital. So I wanna to, want to thank, take a moment to acknowledge the work that they've been doing, it's, it's exceptional. And uh, lastly, I think, acknowledging that we know the, the needs will increase. And so the flexibility within the budget is, is important. The commitment to looking at the health standards and what mental health curriculum is embedded in those standards. And is that meeting our needs? And how are we going to continue the integrated social emotional learning through ruler throughout all schools uh, and supporting staff and students. So those are some components that are part of this specifically. Yes. So, so Carrie Burke has done an excellent Can job. Can you repeat the question as well? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah, Sorry. I was just wondering to, if Mary could um, elaborate on the community collaboration for uh, mental health services. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it, it is a longstanding partnership that was piloted at Enfield Elementary School four to five years ago. Carrie Burke did a great job facilitating uh, an expanded partnership at Ithaca High School. And so as we look to having uh, mental health staff in our buildings to support students after hours, because you know, what we need to provide is a confidential space. Uh, it, it provides, it's much easier for families uh, if their students are already in the building and for students themselves than having to, to go to a different site for that support. Um, <clears throat> this is Elder Chow and I was gonna ask the same exact thing. And I was gonna ask it in the context of the conversation we just previously had about curriculum. We know our leaders have had more time to get comfortable with that language and to express themselves. So what we heard was pretty succinct, right? Interdisciplinary units of discovery that support all of our students beyond the traditional, right? These five components, intersectionality, criticality. I'm gonna ask if you, uh, if our exec team can come up with something as succinct, as similar about our approach to 
to mental health and wellness that we can begin to become comfortable with ourselves as uh, elected officials and executives speaking in that language. And then if we share it with the community, we'll set a standard. There's no, there's no shame to any of us for not having that language yesterday or maybe 10 months ago, but as we go forward, I think we all just need to get better about being on the same page. Actually, you just articulated you know, what it could look like. You mentioned components. Um, so helping us help our community understand that would be really helpful. Um, could I just like to uh, make a comment and ask a question about this topic? It's 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 been coming up from our student reps for some time. It came up very strongly. Um, it's a pillar of our budget and our planning. Um, my observation is that um, the crisis in student mental health for for kids as young as kindergarten and pre K predates the COVID crisis. We may have forgotten that because it's gotten so much worse, but uh, in 2018, you know, a couple, couple of years before this hit, this, this was a huge topic all across the state. Um, the education department and the board of regents um, uh, came up with the, uh, um, uh, well, they basically adopted a new uh, set of, of standards that embedded, that made mental health a key part of the health curriculum K through 12. Uh, they put together the New York State Mental Health Education Advisory Council, which was supposed to be 70 mental health professionals um, and, and academics from across the state to help develop the tools that would give individual school districts support, guidance. Um, so my question is, did that happen? Are we, are we getting anything from the state? Um, is, is that work being done? Is it helpful? And does it come with any funding? I can tell you there's no funding. Um, You're talking New York State. Yeah, and the support from the state as far as the frameworks um, is, it, I think it's, I must underscore what we're attempting to do. Um, what we've typically seen from states and the federal government when it comes to mental health has been absent of the social political context our young people are, must navigate. What we're attempting to do right now is, yeah, this is a budget conversation. In many ways, it's not a budget conversation. This is us revamping the systems of, and structures and mindsets that have traumatized our young people for generations. So what this budget will do, will allow us to do, but this board is allowing us the freedom and the safe space to do, is to rethink how we do business. And that is going to increase and support the social emotional health of our young people. Mm -hmm. I survived school, but I was traumatized by it. My friends are not here because they were traumatized by school. Now, until we fix the ways in which we grade, the ways in which we talk to young people, the ways in which we allow for their humanity to show up in our spaces, until we fix that, let's not talk about mental health and social emotional support, especially around budget. Because what we're talking about really doesn't have a dollar amount connected to it. It has hearts connected to it. And that is the challenge before us right now. It could be $144 million or $88 million until we understand what our young people need as far as us loving them and seeing their joy and brilliance, and then building curriculum and support and conversations to support that, we're not gonna be able to look at Grace and the other folks who are coming meeting after meeting and saying, I don't feel like I belong. Across our country, we can look at right now the number of young people who are coming, who are choosing to come back into our spaces and who are choosing not to, and it's by, it's not a surprise to me that it's disproportionately young people of color and those living in poverty who are choosing not to come back in person. And we need to ask ourselves, why is that? So I, I, this is not a non-budgetary answer to your budget question, I think I heard in there, but it's also, I think you're asking about something bigger. Is the state helping us with this? No, the state has done nothing in my, from my perspective to provide the supports and structures or even the safe space to even engage in this dialogue this board and this community has. Well, and, and that I think is something that's really important uh, to, to bring to the attention of the community. It's that, you know, these are, these are statewide conversations, they're national conversations, and they have been for years and nothing's come of it. And we're really, 
we are really trying and we are really committed and we're going, people are going into the schools, they're listening to families, they're listening to kids and trying to do in many ways, something that hasn't been attempted, you know, and, and it's, it's not going to be easy. It is not going to be perfect, but we're doing it and it's, it's necessary. And I do want to acknowledge the growth and where we've come and where we are. We have one of the best authors in the country, in the world here today, that was talking about very explicitly anti-racism and the things I just talked about. We, we couldn't have done that six years ago. We had Black Lives Matter at Schools Week here. We're one of a handful of districts in the country doing that. And we still have folks who are asking why and telling us not to. Just imagine if we had started talking about that six years ago. So there is, I know it's not fast enough for our young people. <laughs> and, and we are, are continuing to fail a generation of young people each and every day when we don't have this happen at scale. But I, 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 it's important for us to note that we are making some progress. And this budget and this board will continue to allow us to do even more next year. We, um, we damn sure are making progress. And I raised my two nephews here in the mid to late 90s. Uh, graduated, the older one, the younger one came home one day and said, you sent me back to that school. This is a high school. I'm going to take my life. <clears throat> they hate me. Um, Sean can tell you his own stories about raising his child. You know, a lot of times we talk around this, we try to be polite, we're colleagues. Folks just need to understand this is life or death for some of our kids. Um, so we damn sure are making progress. Uh, but I agree, it's not fast enough. It's never gonna be fast enough until we're all safe. That's what I'm asking for some language, right? As a guideline so we can um, begin to get better at this in terms of understanding ourselves and then um, talking about it outside of um, these meetings. Thanks, see. Hey, Chris, you're chair of the Finance Committee. Do you want to weigh in? Just uh, you've been uh, deeply involved. Um, I don't think I can do justice to everything that was just covered. I, you know, really to speak to a year long budget process and trying to fit in everything we want moving forward to really address and mobilize the needs of our students. Is, is how we operate with our budget, budget, which is really unique if you look at how other school districts manage their budget. Um, we actually are, where is, we, we go through the process of where is the need, how do we apply it, and we go to the taxpayers for it, um, which a lot of school districts do a, a simple equation and figure out a percentage and say, this is what we've got. Um, so, you know, Dr. Brown really spoke to, and we've heard from our student reps and, and also the community. We are very, very fortunate to have a robust community and robust tax base that can help support what we do. Um, so, you know, when you look through the budget presentation and the numbers and the shifts, um, it does allow us to be flexible and nimble and address the needs of the community. Um, and I think what we've also looked at is supporting those who need it the most in a way, I think it's, you know, while we get a lot of criticism with what we need to do, we, this will, our budgets allow us to do things differently where a lot of school districts can't. I hope that does, you know, help some folks. But as we get into the details of how we apply it, we're going to need more boots on the ground. We're going to need more bodies, and we're going to need the um, the innovation along with the courage to to make this happen. And you know, I, I use the example of turning a battleship on a dime. While we have some resources, and we want to make change today and right now our budget allows us to make it happen a little bit quicker, but this is still generational issues that we're trying to change um, and be innovative with, and this is what our budget allows us to do. I have a question, um, if I can jump in. I'm going back to the mental health question. Um, going back to budget, I know that Dr. Brown said that he doesn't wanna put a number on it. Um, this question is more for Carrie and, Mary, I'm wondering what the plans are for professional development over the summer as we think about 
our teachers, teachers aides, um, we'll be welcoming back a lot of students in the fall. How are we preparing um, our staff to receive students who have possibly not engaged with others in a really long time? Um, thinking about our staff, how are we preparing them to take on a heavier in-person load in terms of their own limited um, social interaction? Um, I'm just wondering how we're thinking about that. I understand the additional FTEs, but I think it's more about having quality versus like adding more additional people, having the tools. Um, thinking about myself, seeing people in the grocery store who want to reach out to hug me, and I don't really know how to interact with that. And we're talking about, um, you know, smaller people coming in, um, having interacted with other kids. I'm um, thinking about grading and how we're thinking about grading and kids that are struggling emotionally, socially, um, to get back into the swing of five days a week. Um, so if any of you can jump in there, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. If I, if I may jump, jump on in. So I think uh, the summer is gonna be a great moment for us to learn more about what our students are needing as we're offering a five-day program that is half day and in person through Project Innovation. I also think the committee the, and the PLC work of our school social workers and school psychologists are going to be vital to hear from them what they need as well as parents and caregivers. So as far as specific professional development, we are planning for that right now and look forward to having more specifics for you in the, in the next few weeks as we land on what we anticipate students are going to need and families are going to need. Today, Dr. Brown's referenced Jason Reynolds and, and hearing from him today. And there's one point in his presentation where he was talking about humility and the humility of this work and approaching students with humility and asking, what do you need? And, and starting there and thinking about the intimacy and the relationships between teachers and students that is a fantastic approach to foundation for culturally responsive teaching. How are we getting to know them? So as Eldred asked for a framework for how we're gonna talk about this mental health and the specific professional development associated with it. I think that is something we, we cannot build without the insights from our, our social workers and school psychologists right now. I guess I wanna gently push back on that, having lost okay. people to suicide. Sometimes folks don't have the, the words or the ability to, to ask for what they need when they're struggling. So I think sometimes having the tools to be able to see the signs when people are struggling and not expecting adults, let alone children, to know how to ask when they, what they need when it comes to mental health. That's a great point. I think part of the integrated social emotional approach is being able to name how you're feeling, but to you make a great point of what you need to move out of one feeling to another is, is well, well taken. And I, Adam, I, it looks like um, you've certainly been, uh, you pop back up. Um, I believe you have a question, but, but certainly go ahead. Yeah, um, so I, I was uh, looking through the budget and one figure um, stood out to me, which is the 26% decrease in uh, money allocated for teacher assistant salaries for grades seven through 12. Mm -hmm. um, and just upon seeing that, uh, I was a little alarmed um, considering uh, how much I know teacher assistants are in demand um, especially um, this year with COVID and I'm sure next year and for many years beyond that, um, as especially as we focus on trying to provide more support and mental health support for students in schools. Um, so uh, I, I see in little red writing below that, it says decrease due to breakage and retirement. Um, but I was just wondering how the district plans on um, making up for the loss of teaching assistance in the schools in order to continue to provide um, 
the necessary support for teachers and students uh, in the schools? So I'm going to take that one, Adam. It's a great question, and it's always one that comes up every single year because a budget document, although we try so hard to put in narrative that gives the um, the background and the explanation and creates sort of the humanity to the numbers, right? Uh, it's really, it's difficult to do that in an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet, right? So what you see there, that is not a decrease of people. What you see is a decrease in the difference between someone who has worked in the district and is making a certain salary level over the course of a number of years, 20, 30 years, when they retire and their ref that position is refilled with a new hire, there is a difference in that salary from the person's salary that retired to the person's salary that is hired. And so throughout the budget, you're gonna see fluctuations um, like that when, when folks actually um, move on to retirement to really happy, wonderful times and leave happy, wonderful times as employment, um, that they're replaced with folks that make a, a less amount than they do. The other thing about um, that line, if you notice, that is teacher assistance. That is only one element of support staff. We also have teacher aides. So if you move down a little bit in that, um, in that budget document and you look at the non-instructional salaries, the reason why we have to call teacher aides non-instructional is because they're actually in a different retirement system. They're in a, an employee retirement system, not the teacher retirement system. So oftentimes you'll see as well, if a teacher assistant um, either retires or leaves, or we don't need a teacher assistant who actually has um, uh, training and a number of, of hours that they can actually do instruction, um, that we can actually utilize an aid who is equally important, but just has a different background and training, um, that would also mean that we might, um, someone would be coded in a different line. It doesn't mean that we've decreased services. Um, the other area where teacher aides and assistants show up, so what you were looking at is in the 2110, which are teacher aides and assistants that are for students who are not in the special education program. Teacher aides and assistants who support students in the special education program are coded in a different area of the budget. And that's actually down on the 2250. And so if you look at that, you have to look at all of these things together. And as you can see there, um, those were uh, significant increases uh, in those budgets. So, so again, a budget document, it's really difficult because you so wanna isolate one line item but you just can't, they all work in tandem. And so you have to look at the whole picture because it could be a coding issue or a retirement issue. Um, and it's, you, it, as Dr. Brown said, this is not a budget where we've cut. Uh, we would not be seeing the increases that we've seen um, if, if we were cutting. And so you have to look at the whole picture. So that's a thank you for that question because I think it's so important to share that information out to the community who doesn't, get the benefit of looking at these numbers every day and recognizing that these are people. Thanks, Amanda. Any other, other questions from the board or anyone at this time? Moria, anything? Uh, just going back to the slide presentation, I thought I may be mistaken that I saw two different numbers on two different slides about the de decrease in the tax rate. Um, yeah, maybe like I'm wrong. 0.43 something. Yeah, and then it was, and then it was 0.26. Yeah. Uh oh, that may have been. Not, uh, not that we're picking at uh, numbers <laughs> or anything, but uh, okay, Moira and I noticed it. So what's the, what's the deal? Don't put it back up again. Emily. <laughs> Those are estimations. Dr. Brown, I've got you. It's probably, I might have emailed Dr. Brown two different numbers. I'm going to totally own it, Dr. Brown. It's not right. No, you don't have to, I, no. I messed up. It could be a range. It could yeah. just be an error. But the, remember that tax rate decrease? We don't know that until we know right. the total assessed value that comes from the Tompkins County Assessment Department. So what you're seeing on that slide is an estimate no matter what. So it could be any one of those numbers or something different, but we know it will be going down. 
We'll, uh, we'll know in August, approximately. Amanda, right? Typically August time that, frame. That is correct, right. So right. so we start to get information and, and then the board would adopt that information as well. Once we get, get that from the Tompkins County Assessment Department, they're still doing their work and calculating sort of the total assessed value of the community. Why do I feel like I'm back in ninth grade English class and Moyer just corrected my paper? Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Just, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I'll I, I fix it. Be right. Consistency, uh, Dr. Brown. <laughs> uh, consistency. But, oh, uh, but Amanda, we, we are quite uh, with full confidence know that uh, our tax rate will go down uh, once the assessed value comes in. Um, you know, our, our tax levy limit that tax cap at 2.96. Um, you know, we, we, Amanda, we do get information from the county. They certainly expect the assessed value of the county property is going to go up more than 3%, right? So, that is correct. right, it's, it's advancing faster than the tax levy limit. Um, so that's, you know, we can have a pretty good idea that uh, we'll uh, uh, continue to be able to offer a, a tax rate reduction. Uh, of those dollars per hundred dollars per thousand that uh, that folks have to pay. Um, other other questions. Um, there is a resolution in front of us. Um, we can certainly, if someone wished to move it and second it, we can. Rob, really that's why I raised my hand. I make a motion that. Be it resolved that the final budget for the Ithaca City School District for the fiscal year of 2021-2022 be hereby adopted by the Board of Education in the amount of $145,179,885. And I know we like round numbers. Second. And second by who was Elder. Elder, second by Elder. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Move seconded. Any other questions right now? If not, then a pregnant pause. Uh, but uh, I think we can, Tricia, I think we can go ahead and call the roll. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Erin Coyle? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Nicole Lefebvre? Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Ann Reichland? Yes. Patricia Wazler? Yes. Did Nicole have an opportunity to pop back in? Nicole? Just for the official record, but. Uh, Resolution passes. We'll, uh, and Nicole certainly was in on the uh, conversation. Thank you. Uh, well, um, congratulations, uh, exec team, uh, building leaders, budget builders uh, across this, this district. Uh, the board certainly is uh, thankful for your work. Um, again, um, $145 million is, um, it's always the largest budget we've ever passed, but uh, <laughs> Um, I think this is probably one of the most important budgets that uh, we've passed in uh, well in, in quite a while. Uh, we are at uh, we are at a crossroads in public education, and it's how we address what we do next, and that shows the strength of a district or the strength of our our team. Uh, we have great confidence that we have um, some of the best thought leaders, not only in New York State but the country. It's not just Dr. Brown either. Um, so just, uh, we really are uh, blessed to, uh, to have a district that has been able to attract the talent that we do. So thank you all uh, one more time for all your work. We're not done because we're uh, going to adopt. Amanda, it is the uh, property, it's the property tax report card is the next up, correct? That is correct. And this is um, by state law. Right. This would once the budget is adopted by the board, that would then that would be the budget that we would take forward to the public for the vote on May 18th. Uh, a property tax report card is required because essentially it is a transparency report to the public. It essentially tells the public how what is our tax levy calculation, 
what is the amount of money that we are gonna be um, proposing in terms of our, our levy amount and our proposed budget, as well as transparency around um, all of our reserves and fund balance. As you all know, and I shared that we would be using some fund balance and reserves to support uh, the budget amount. And so this is an opportunity for the district to share with the public the ways in which we manage any funds that when we end the year we have in surplus and where we put them and then how we're going to expend them. Thanks, Mayor. Rob, to, um, to begin yes, with this, go ahead. I move the resolution to adopt the ICSD property tax report card, whereas the Board of Education of the Ithaca City School District, the City of New York and Tompkins County desires to adopt a property tax report card to accompany the annual school district budget for the fiscal year 2021-2022. And whereas the property tax report card requires sections 1608, 7, 1716-7, and 2601-A3 of the educational law as follows. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Ithaca City School District of the City of Ithaca, New York, agrees to adopt the, top, the property tax report card to accompany the annual school budget for the fiscal year 2021-2022. Second. Second by Mara and Sean, thank you. I was going to make you read it. Uh, so glad you volunteered. Uh, we are, uh, this meeting is being transcribed for the record, historical record. We do uh, appreciate you uh, reading in the resolution and move seconded and I think Amanda did a fine job explaining what it is. So Tricia, please go ahead. Rob Ainsley. Yes. Erin Croyle. Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Yes. Eldred Harris. Yes. Moira Lang. Yes. Chris Malcolm. Yes. Anne Reichlin. Yes. Patricia Wazlu. Yes. Very good. Thanks, everyone. And we'll move right on to really the, the topic that we really wanted to get to is uh, really the 21-22 academic calendar. And we do believe there is a uh, an adjustment in the draft. If uh, we could just have someone who knows? Yeah, Ms. Kalk is going to speak briefly to what we've done. Uh, thank Brief you. It. Thank you so much. So for, for everyone who's, who's come this evening or spoken this evening, and also those who submitted a great number of uh, Let's Talk submissions, which are also a, a, attached. Thank you, Emily, for doing that as well. Um, so the original calendar that was submitted to the board in March was that which the uh, TST BOCES region had adopted, right? Um, and taking the discussions, taking the feedback, of course, uh, we came, we went back to the table and you'll see that there are a number of adjustments, right? So first and foremost, you'll see that there's instead a district conference day added on September 8th, right? So, so instead of starting school for young people, right? And for staff on, on that day, that's actually a district conference day, which allows for much more flexibility, right? Um, it allows for more, um, more professional development um, at the beginning of the school year and also addresses the, the numerous concerns that were raised this, this evening. Um, and essentially that staff day then was swapped with Juneteenth. So Juneteenth was off for students and that's how both these has, has coded it. And we've decided that it actually should be off for everybody. Right, um, and so, so that's, that's where we made that, that adjustment for the staff days there. And then so you'll see all of the, um, the start dates then are instead on September 9th and September 10th um, for young people and for, and for staff, and, all right. Um, you'll also see that uh, May 27th was once a vacation day, Memorial Day recess, and that has also been removed, right? So that that staff day trade that I just talked about, we had to do an in-person day trade for our state regulations as well. So that was that in-person trade day, um, which May 27th in the past has been utilized as, um, as a, uh, uh, essentially a floating day in case we have too many, too many snow days. Um, we're not sure what snow days will hold for us in the future, but it appears there may be some flexibility now with remote learning and um, some of the things that we've seen there. So it seems like an appropriate adjustment to make at this time. 
So I want to send, I really actually meant to start with this. I want to give a huge shout out to our students who two years ago and last year as well really have, have pushed us to create a more inclusive calendar. Um, and although I certainly don't believe that it is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, I think we are getting better. Um, and, and I think the second draft is an indication of that. So, thank you. Uh, thanks, Lou. Um, it seems to make sense. Uh, is, this, is this supposed to make sense? I mean, finally uh, is... I mean, Rob, if I had anything to do with it, it's supposed to make sense. Yeah, oh, there, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank Good you answer. Lily. Uh, Good it sounds like very, uh, very uh, pretty straightforward and very reasonable adjustments that uh, solves a bunch of issues, right? So, sounds good. Yeah, can I just make one comment on the calendar? I definitely like the second draft better. And I, the students that came a couple of years ago were very, uh, had the idea of at least putting the holidays on the calendar. And so I think it's for that reason that the particular intersection of Rosh Hashanah was understood. You know, it, we were actually able to see the problem. So I, I'm really appreciative of that. Um, you know, that, that, so, I mean, I think it, it's for very good reason to have all those holidays listed, even if you can't accommodate all of them. And I think um, they, uh, account, this particular intersection of a first day of school with a, a major holiday, a Jewish holidays, uh, specifically um, problematic. So I'm, I'm really glad that this draft addresses it. Uh, so I'd like to open. Yeah, sorry. Oh, Sean, were you? I'll, I'll wait, Moira. Thank you. Yeah, Moira, go, and Moira, and then Sean. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, so I definitely am, am uh, very, very pleased with the adjustments that were made with the uh, second draft. Um, and I think Anne's point is a good one. When we uh, added, when pushed by students, we added uh, major holidays and had them mentioned on the calendar, we could see that we had a problematic uh, um, intersection. Uh, the other thing though, that we were hearing a number of comments on uh, the Let's, Let's Talk portal was on the spring break dates. And there are people who are advocating for pushing the spring bay break up a week. I never know whether it's up or back when you try to, but making the spring break coincide with Cornell spring break, which would be, um, you know, starting on Saturday the 2nd and going through the 10th rather than the following week. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is to why this is a problem, which is that we would not be coinciding with the BOCES calendar, and that would be a problem for our BOCES students. Um, so, you know, any other comments or discussions of that? Uh, I, right, I'm listening. <laughs> our BOCES, uh, our, our students that take uh, advantage of the BOCES programs would miss essentially two weeks of program. Mm -hmm. And um, right. the, um, the idea that uh, perhaps Cornell could change their calendar. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, there is that. <laughs> since I'm, a, I'm on Cornell Council, maybe I'll bring it up. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's an uh, it's ongoing issue with uh, the Cornell calendar and, right. and our district calendar that is in, in uh, coordination with BOCES and the other uh, districts in the county. So uh, that's, um, and, and frankly not, um, there are some uh, certainly that uh, take family vacations in the spring. Um, I grew up in a family, uh, we did not take family vacations and there's a lot, frankly, a lot of kids that probably uh, where they go for spring vacation is not the highest thought um, for that family, if I can say it that way. Um, so it's, um, yeah, so I, I think, well, frankly, it would be, uh, I look forward to the day when folks can do a family vacation and travel and go where they want to. So uh, that will come, uh, but uh, we'll, uh, uh, I think uh, right now it's going to be problematic to try to sync with Cornell. Just my opinion. Uh, Sean, do you want to? 
Uh, William? Yeah, I'll begin by responding to that. I think um, one of the beauties of living in Ithaca is that it is a multiple college town or university town. Mm -hmm. And so while the current spring break does not coincide with Cornell, it does coincide with Ithaca College. And there is a reason why um, year to year Cornell and IC have tried to have conversations about when they're going to alternate their spring breaks. Um, and Cornell is the major employer and the next second major employer is Ithaca College. And so I appreciate those comments um, about trying to match our spring break to Cornell. Uh, but it does match up with Ithaca College this year, and that is not always the case. And so each year we have something different to look forward to. Um, I feel compelled to say this about the, the calendar, um, and I greatly appreciate our students, and I continue to try to think about how to be creative. Um, in theory, we have this idea of separation of church and state, which tries to prevent us from providing breaks for religious holidays. Um, I've also said before to all of our board colleagues um, that it's clear that our, our calendar is um, Christian centric. Um, with that being said, I'm also aware that New York State considers Christmas to be a secular holiday and not a religious holiday. Um, so there are questions about sort of that break. Uh, but again, there are other religious holidays that we do not acknowledge, even while they are listed on our uh, calendar. I am thankful that uh, given the fact that Cornell and Ithaca College for the first time in both institutions history have given uh, their employees and their students um, Juneteenth in recognition of um, Emancipation Day. And so uh, I'm glad that we have followed suit for all of the folks who are affiliated with ICSD. Um, and with that being said, similar to what Ms. Talkett said, um, this is, it, it makes as much sense as we can make it <laughs> make, given all the factors we have between our employers, our accompanying school districts, um, and the um, extremely diverse community we have here in Ithaca. And we'll continue to try to push our calendar as much as possible. So for the folks who made the second round, a great appreciation of thanks for all the work. Um, thank you very much. Anyone else? Sean, you want to move the calendar? Uh, sure, if I can find my, I make a motion to adopt the 2021-2022 academic calendar. Uh, draft, a particular draft? Draft, or? Uh, draft six, more, no, I'm, I apologize <laughs> for the transcript that's gonna be written. Draft two, though I will also tell our public that last year, uh, again, that we are also flexible to the times and we have made changes. So this is what we're preparing for, but I make the motion to adopt draft two of the academic calendar of 2021-2022. Second. Second by Pat. And um, you know we do remember when Bob Van Curen came to us probably six times with the calendar, not too long ago. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, let's hope that uh, this one is uh, is one we can uh, maintain for a bit. But Bob, always happy. Whatever you need, right? Just whatever. You need. Um, I think we're. Uh, if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead. Tricia, please. Rob Ainsley. Yes. Aaron Croyle. Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Yes. Eldred Harris. Yes. Moira Lang. Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Ann Reichland? Yes. Pat Wazelow? Yes. Thanks, Pat. Uh, thank you, Sean. And well, um, now, uh, Pat, Moira, and Sean, there's uh, policies uh, for first readings. Can we roll through those? Uh, there... Sean, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, there's only one policy for a first reading, and that is 2350 board meeting procedures uh, are the um, schedule of our board agendas are um, dictated by board policy. Uh, this policy was voted on, I want to say, in 2014. Um, most recently, our student reps um, asked the board to consider that we have public comment, board responses, student delegation updates, and then board responses again. Uh, we discussed this at the policy committee. Um, including other members of the board who are not on the policy committee, 
and everyone seemed to be in agreement that um, that made sense to us. And so uh, this policy is a version that will change to do just that, that um, agenda item four would be the hearing of public comments, board responses, hearing of student updates, and then board responses. And so with that quick explanation, I move policy 2350 uh, board meeting procedures for a first reading. Second. Mr. Memoria. Uh, Sean, can we just vote? Um, or do we need to talk more? Up to the up to the board. I would just point out that the uh, the modification to the agenda tonight reflected uh, a possible procedure going forward, and so we experimented tonight. And so that what you heard and saw uh, and participated in is what we look to do in the future once this is passed the second time. But uh, where anything you need to policy well, committee? I thought it went well tonight and sure. uh, and our discussion, uh, a number of people, not just policy committee members, uh, weighed in on what they thought would was were the benefits to this change. And so I'm in favor. Very good. So uh, it, it was seconded, right? It was moved yes, second. I seconded. Yep. Right. And um, unless I hear somebody chime in, we're, uh, let's uh, go ahead. Tricia, please. Roll call. Rob Ainsley. Yes. Aaron Croyle. Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Yes. Eldred Harris. Yes. Moira Lang. Yes. Chris Malcolm. Yes. Ann Reichland. Yes. Pat Wazley. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Sean, other policies? Yes. At the last full boarding meet or uh, voting meeting, we had a conversation about policy 1230, which uh, discusses the board meeting procedures for how public comment is engaged. Uh, during that policy meeting, um, policy members, uh, Moira Lang and Pat Wazalu, in addition to other board members, had a conversation about should we change that policy? And at that point in time, the policy committee decided to keep the policy as is. If board members want to further raise it, please let us know. Um, but at this point in time, it's just giving an update that we are not changing that policy for the moment. Um, okay, so we're, so we're good or? What do we, um, I got lost in my agenda, Sean. It's, it's not that I wasn't- Yeah, sure. That's kind of no, quite all right, Rob. If any um, board members have questions, feel free to let us know or tell us that we should put it back on a policy committee agenda and we can revisit the conversation that we had previously. Pat or Moira, anything that you would add? Uh, just, a, just a reminder, um, to to everyone in the community that this is our this is our standing policy and um we reviewed it in um response to um people reading anonymous letters and while this policy does not explicitly prohibit the reading of anonymous letters i'd just like to bring two um phrases to everyone's attention. In paragraph two, persons wishing to address the board shall advise the board president prior to the scheduled starting time of the meeting, the request shall be made in writing on a form provided by the district clerk and shall include the name of the speaker, the address, the name of the organization represented, if any, and the topic to be addressed. Any group of organizations wishing to address the board must identify a spokesperson. Um, and so this, this, that is calling for the identification of anyone who is presenting to the board. And then um, in paragraph five, um, board members and the superintendent shall have the privilege of asking questions of, person, of persons who address the board. And um, that phrase also assumes that people must be identified so that they can they can be addressed. Um, so that is our policy as it stands. We we 
did discuss um, whether to change it or not. And the recommendation of the policy committee is that it not change. And we are just bringing it to the full board um, to see if there is disagreement. Thanks, Pat. Any, obviously, uh, any and all policies uh, as we've done uh, can be brought up and revisited at any time. Um, but right now, um, there was discussion at the policy work session, which I was there, Sean, it was great. And uh, <laughs> always enjoy the, uh, the interaction. And uh, so discuss there. Uh, thank you, Pat, for your uh, review. And if we, um, I'm doing a segue, if, unless I hear anything. Um, we have one more very important item to, for Tricia. This is for Tricia. Um, you're good? All right, so we're good. And it is um, one of those things that we do every year and is the resolution appointing election officials. And um, we should mention, we, we voted on a budget. We will be voting for um, three uh, board seats. Um, certainly, I, would, I thank Nicole, Moira, and Pat for, sorry, Ann, sorry, Ann, <laughs> Pat, sir, um, Ann, Moira, and Nicole um, passing petitions and are willing to step forward one more time uh, to take on the great challenges of, uh, that we face and are, uh, I believe, are running again. Um, and this is an opportunity for those in the community. If you wish to run, um, there's, there are petitions to pass and you should connect with Tricia, the board clerk, and that is how you uh, can get on the ballot. But uh, for right now, uh, in order to have a legal and binding election, we need election officials. And Tricia is in charge of our elections, does an outstanding job. So this resolution gives her the folks that will be manning the various election posts, election spots, the uh, polling stations. Um, there are 12 of them, Tricia, correct? Correct, correct. 12 different locations. We uh, Folks will be voting in person. Absentee ballots are available. Uh, you could, again, go through Tricia, the board clerk, via the uh, board building and the administration offices. But uh, voting is in person at the various uh, locations of our polling uh, places, places to poll. But they are listed here. Um, just want to make that clear that uh, we're back to a fairly normal election cycle uh, and the district will not be sending out ballots to all property owners or all uh, registered voters in the county. Uh, it will be in-person voting and for the most of everyone uh, on that date, which is May 18th, yeah. I think, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so that's um, on a very important day for the district and for the future of this district. So. Uh, Glad to have a resolution for uh, appointing the. Uh, Does the whole thing have to be read? No, no. Okay, then I move uh, to approve the appointment of election officials for the 2021 budget vote and election. And Second. Two, uh, right. Second by Pat. Yes. Um, two more of his points. Uh, it is basically the resolution does list every single polling place, uh, which is uh, a variety of schools and Danby Fire Station, a few other spots, but it is listed. It will be uh, obviously very public knowledge. And once we pass it and, uh, and Tricia will get her uh, election officials lined up and uh, we'll have our, our vote on May 18th. So move seconded and Tricia, go ahead. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Erin Croyle? Yes. Dawn Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Ann Reichland? Yes. Pat Wazalu? Yes. Thanks, Pat. Uh, that really gets us down to other business. Dr. Brown, anything else? Nothing else for this evening. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, exec team, thank you. Um, uh, history was made tonight. This was the, indeed, first hybrid uh, school board meeting I think uh, has ever been held at the Ithaca City School District. So thank you to the Daphne and thank you to the, the folks in the back. Um, and thank you for the technology that we have in this building, uh, which is 
Thank you to the, for the taxpayers for all that uh, they do to uh, help us do what we do, and but uh, for the use of students and uh, and curriculum. Uh, so uh, a good first shot, Dr. Brown, yeah, and uh, we will be um, unless uh, we uh, inform the public, we will meet, be meeting um, in a hybrid fashion the rest of the year. Um, our students are in the buildings, our teachers are in the building, our custodians, truck drivers. We will be in buildings meeting in person, uh, and also some will be uh, meeting uh, via this link. Uh, we all look forward to the day when we can be in one room, and uh, we look forward to the day when all students are back in the buildings. And so, uh, but we are getting there, and uh, we, uh, I'm ready to call it a night, Dr. Brown. I'm sure uh, you are, and everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Tricia, Emily. Uh, outstanding job, as always. Appreciate it. Thank you.